Hey guys, Brian Kelly here from Zombie Guitar. Here in today's video, I wanted to do a follow-up of my video from last week, which is called Solo Like a Pro Without Using Music Theory. The reason that I'm saying that it is without music theory is because that there is a very clear distinction, or there should be a very clear distinction, between general music theory, which is music theory that applies to every single instrument, and then there's guitar-specific, I refer to it as shape theory. All right, so things like the five pentatonic positions, the cage system, the three note per string patterns, all of these patterns on the fretboard that, are, that, that the notes form, that's what I refer to as guitar-specific shape theory. Does it have some aspects of general music theory in there? Yes, it does. But is it the same thing as general music theory? No, it is not. They are two different things. It is my job to make this very, very clear distinction between general music theory and guitar-specific shape theory. If you are interested in some general music theory type of stuff, I did another video. It's called Demystifying the Guitar Fretboard by Using a Piano. I'll post a link to that as well. So that is general music theory. This two-part series, for which this video is the second part of, this is about the shape theory aspect. All right, so just as a quick review of part one, the only information that you need to apply the layer one concepts, which is the ability to solo up and down the entire neck of the guitar in any key, that's what I refer to as layer one, the only information that you need is the name of the key. That's it. All right, so let's say that you want to solo in the key of A minor. You need to know the letter name of the key, which is A, and then you need to know if it's major or minor. If it's major, you locate your reference position by putting your pinky on the note A. If it's minor, you put your index finger on the note A. The, the key is A minor, so index finger goes on the note A, right there, fifth fret of the low E string. That is your reference position. We refer to that as pentatonic position number one. So from there, you can expand and cover the entire fretboard and play in the key of A minor. But also in part one, we kind of simplified things and we formed just this little diagonal pattern. We have a couple notes down here, which we refer to as the lower extension. And then we have some notes up here, which we refer to as the upper extension. So just focusing on the key, which is the key of A minor, you can use this as your soloing framework. <laughs> Alright, so having the ability to solo in key up and down the entire neck of the guitar is a very, very big thing. It takes a long time to learn. It takes a long time to internalize this stuff. It is very, very important to learn how to do this. I refer to this as layer one. Many, many, many guitar players are only aware of the existence of layer one. They don't really take it to that next level. All right, the layer two level, which is what we're going to talk about now. What I mean by layer two is... All right, you talk to your rhythm guitar player, you say, hey, what's the key that we're in? The rhythm guitar player says, all right, we're in the key of A minor. Hold on one second. What are the actual chords? I don't just care about the key. I care about the chords too. The rhythm guitar set player says, all right, the chords are A minor, C major, G major, F major. Cool. Got it. That's layer two. Layer two is focusing on each individual chord in the underlying chord progression. So there's a million different ways to play an A minor chord across the entire neck. There's a million different ways to play a C major chord. There's a million different ways to play a G major chord and an F major chord. Maybe not a million, I'm exaggerating, but there's a lot of different ways to play each of these chords. They form these different shapes. So we're just gonna look at these chord shapes in this little diagonal framework that we're playing in. So to find the A minor chord in this little framework, you're gonna find the A minor chord in this shape right here. Here's an A minor chord. The C major chord is going to be found in this shape. The G major chord is going to be found in this shape. The F major chord is going to be found in this shape. Now that was just kind of containing ourselves within that little four fret area. But if you want to find some additional chord shapes here, 
around this fret region and up in this fret region, you can. So you have an A minor chord like this. You also have an A minor chord in this shape. You have a C major chord in this shape. You also have a C major chord in this shape. You have a G major chord in this shape. You also have a G major chord in this shape. And then you have an F major chord in this shape. You also have an F major chord in this shape. All right, so at this point, a lot of people may be thinking one of two things. Number one, you may be thinking, wow, that's a lot to remember. Number two, you may be thinking, how did you determine those chord shapes? And we're going to talk about all of that in this video. The cool thing about the guitar and the whole point of the shape theory thing that I'm talking about is that if you learn how to solo over this specific chord progression in the key of A minor and you get really good at keeping up with the chord changes, if you get really, really good at just this four chord chord progression in the key of A minor, you can then do the exact same thing in any of the other 12 keys. The shapes are identical. Just like the scale shape is identical for all 12 keys, the chord shapes within the scale patterns, which is what I refer to as layer two, is also the same for all 12 keys. All right, so the way that I suggest practicing this stuff is to literally just put on a backing track and instead of soloing over the backing track, just play the chord changes. And when I say play the chord changes, I'm not talking about playing the open position chords that you probably already know. I'm talking about playing these new chord shapes up in this soloing area that we're talking about. We have four chords to focus on, an A minor, a C major, a G major, and an F major. Once you feel comfortable with keeping up with the chord changes in that manner, then you can start to incorporate it into your soloing. So the whole purpose of identifying these chord shapes is those are going to be your golden notes. As you are soloing, you can focus just on this, the overall scale. That's fine. You can focus on the scale. You can use your ear to kind of guide you around the scale. Some notes are going to sound better than other notes. Those notes that sound better than other notes are more often than not going to be chord tones. Do that, get really, really good at that for this particular key, which is the key of A minor, and then you're going to find that you can do the exact same thing for any key. So let's say that we want to take this exact same chord progression and we want to move it to the key of C minor. So I played almost exactly the same solo, I just played it in a different key. I played it in the key of C minor instead of the key of A minor. The chord progression that was happening when we were playing the key of A minor was this. So I just simply took that same chord progression and I moved it to the key of C minor, which is like this. The shapes are exactly the same. We have our little soloing framework here for the key of A minor, and the embedded chord shapes within are exactly the same as they are for C minor. This is for all of the keys, all 12 keys. That's why I'm saying if you get really, really good at soloing over this specific chord progression in the key of A minor, you can solo over the same chord progression in any of the 12 keys. Now, when I say this specific chord progression, this is where we get a little bit more into a little bit more of the music theory aspect of it. All right, it's still shape theory. 
a little bit of music theory. So instead of calling the initial chord progression an A minor, a C major, a G major, and an F major, what we're going to do is we're going to call it a 6, 1, 5, 4 progression. You apply numbers to the chords. So A minor is 6, C major is 1, G major is 5, F major is 4. So this is where the circle of fifths comes into play. In any of the 12 keys, you have three major chords and three minor chords. We started out in the key of A minor. All of the chords within any of the 12 keys are always going to be grouped together in a grouping of six like so. So your one chord is always going to be the outer circle center. The two chord is always going to be inner circle counterclockwise. Three chord is always going to be inner circle clockwise. Four chord is outer circle counterclockwise. Five chord is outer circle clockwise. Six chord is inner circle center. So we played a six, one, five, four progression. So if you wanted to move that to the key of C minor, which is the same key signature as E flat major, there's a major name for the key signature and a minor name for the key signature. It's just one of the 12 possible key signatures. You could very, very easily make that determination as to what the six chord is, what the one chord is, what the five chord is, and what the four chord is. So rather than thinking about them as individual chords, you just think about them as numbers. Six, one, five, four. Calling the initial chord progression the key of A minor, you could have also called it the key of C major because if you looked at the chords contained within, it contained an A minor chord and it contained a C major chord, as well as the F major and G major chords. So was it the key of A minor? Was it the key of C major? I don't know. It's, it's really up to you what you want to call it. It would be called the key of C major if you went through the whole song and you ended on a nice happy C major chord. <laughs> then you could safely say, okay, that was the key of C major. Or if you went through the whole entire song and then you ended on a sad A minor chord, you could safely say that it was the key of A minor. But just looking at a simple four chord chord progression like we're doing now, that contains both an A minor chord and a C major chord. Is it the key of A minor? Is it the key of C major? It doesn't really matter. It's the same key signature. There's 12 of them. So with that said, if you find yourself in a situation where you're trying to jam along with either a backing track or a live band, and the information given to you is that it is in the key of B major, again, you only need to know the B part, and then you need to know major, minor, major. So B major. Find the note B on the fretboard right here, seventh fret. That's the note B, but you don't put your index finger on that. You put your pinky finger on it right there. So there's your pentatonic position number one. There's your reference position. I refer to this as the home box. You can go ahead and you can add in your little lower extension here. You can go ahead and you can add in your upper extension here. Right, so the final thing I want to talk about in this video is outside chords. So you already know that no matter what key you're playing in, whichever one of the 12 key signatures that you're playing in, you have your three major chords and you have your three minor chords. Now that's great to know that that's a lot to take in. I understand that. Get really, really good at learning where those chord shapes fall into the, the, the soloing framework pattern that you're practicing for one key. You can therefore do it in all 12 keys because the shapes remain constant for all the keys on the guitar. Beyond that, though, you're going to find that sometimes there's outside chords used. You're not always just going to be soloing over chord progressions that contain 100% in-key chords. Sometimes there will be outside chords. Again, we can apply shape theory here to help us identify the nearest available chord shape. So it doesn't matter where you're at on the fretboard. You can play an A minor chord here. You can play an A minor chord here. You can play an A minor chord here. Play an A minor chord here. There's a bazillion different ways to play an A minor chord. There's a bazillion different ways to play a B major chord. There's a bazillion different ways to play a C sharp minor chord. Every single chord that you could possibly think of can be played in every single 
location of the fretboard. Therefore, when you have your soloing framework that you're playing in, which is just this little pentatonic position number one with the lower extension and the upper extension added, you have like this little eight to 10 fret range that you're playing in. Every single chord can be played within that eight to, to 10 fret range. And it doesn't matter what key you happen to be playing in. Every single chord can be found right underneath your fingertips, no matter where you're at on the fretboard. So for this example, we're gonna be in the key of D major. Key, that's layer one. The key is D major. So we know the letter name of the key, which is D, and then we know that it's major, major. Take your pinky, put it on the 10th fret right there, which is the note D. That's how you find your reference position, your pentatonic position number one. Add your lower extension, add your upper extension. That's your soloing framework for the purpose of this lesson that we're focusing on. You can find any chord that you could possibly think of in this area. Somewhere in this area, every single chord is available to you. So how do we do this? All you have to know is four shapes. If the root note of the chord in question is on the E string, you have this shape available to you, or you have this shape available to you. In the cage system, this is referred to as the E shape and the G shape. If the root note of the chord in question is on the A string, you have this shape available to you and this shape available to you. This is referred to as the C shape and the A shape if you're referring to the cage system. So those are major chord shapes. If you happen to encounter minor chords, you can make a slight alteration to these shapes and then play them in their minor form. So for the first two chord shapes that we looked at, the ones that are rooted on the low E string, you have this minor chord shape available to you, and then you have this minor chord shape available to you. You do not have to play these chord shapes in their full six string form. More often than not, you're just gonna be focusing on the high three or four strings or something like that, but this is where they come from. They come from these full six string shapes. If you have a minor chord and its root is located on the A string, you have this minor chord shape available to you, or you have this minor chord shape available to you. So just knowing that stuff, all you need to know is, okay, I have my chord in question. I know what the root note of the chord is. Now I just have to find where the root note is on either the low E string or the A string. And I try and find it in within my little soloing framework that I'm playing in. Get good at doing this one time in one single key you can then do it for any of the 12 keys because the shapes remain constant. So we've already identified the key, the layer one as D major. D major, put your pinky on the note D right there, 10th fret, there's your pentatonic one, there's your lower extension, there's your upper extension. The actual chords in the progression are going to be D major to A major to F sharp major to G major. Let's find all of these chord shapes within this little soloing framework by using this shape theory by locating the root notes on either the low E string or the A string. So the first chord in question is a D major chord. We already know that we have the note D right there. That is rooted on the low E string. Therefore, we have this shape available to us right here. This is a hard one to play. You don't have to play the full six string form of this chord shape if you don't want. I just like to play the high four strings like this. You also have this shape available to you. So put your index finger on the note D and you can play that. Again, you don't have to play the full six strings. If you don't want, you can just play the high four strings like this. All right, so that's the D major chord. That's where your D major chord tones are located for this little soloing area. The next chord is an A major chord. Now we find our root note A. You have an A here fifth fret of the low E string. You also have an A up here, 12th fret of the A string. So we'll start down here. So because the root note is located on the low E string here, you have these two available chord shapes to you. Put your third finger down there on that note A, play that. Or if you don't like that shape, put your index finger down on the root note A, play this shape. come up to this A up here. You can either put your pinky down right here and apply this shape. You can put your index finger down on the note A, apply this shape. 
So you have all these different A major chord shapes available to you in this soloing framework here. So it's a D major chord to an A major chord. The next chord is an F sharp major chord. So let's find the root note. We have an F sharp down here. It's a little bit out of our soloing area that we're focusing on for now, so we're not going to worry about that. You have an F sharp note right there. That's kind of right within the pattern that we're in, this little soloing area. So we're just going to kind of focus there. So the root note is on the A string. So you have this shape. Put your pinky on the root note. You have this shape available to you. Or put your index finger down here. You have this shape available to you. And then the final chord is a G major chord. You have a note G down here that's a little bit out of our soloing area. You have a note G right there that's right within the area that we're playing in. So we'll just focus on that. The root note's on the A string. Again, put your pinky on the root note. Apply this shape. Or put your index finger on that root note. The more songs you learn, the more chord progressions that you practice soloing over, you're going to start to see that it's the same stuff over and over and over and over again. Yes, the keys may be different, but the actual chord progressions are, it's very common. You know, like there's, there's just like, there's a handful of chord progressions that come up over and over and over again. So this particular chord progression, we're in the key of D major here. Use your circle of fifths. D major is your one chord, outer circle center position. A major is your five chord, outer circle clockwise position. G major is your four chord, outer circle counterclockwise position. And then you have this one outside chord as well. That's the F sharp major chord. Again, you can use your circle of fifths to help you to recognize how exactly that chord is outside. Within your grouping of six, the F sharp chord within this key should be a minor chord if you want to remain in key but it was made into a major chord so that's the three chord in this key inner circle clockwise position that's the three chord we're playing a one five three four chord progression it's just that the three is made into a major chord so you're kind of altering what you're doing in this specific situation over a an altered three chord minor into major that situation is going to come up a whole lot get good at soloing over this specific chord progression this one five major three four chord progression and then you can do it in any key because the shapes are always going to remain constant so um yeah i mean i know this may be a lot a lot to take in digesting the layer one stuff is a lot easier and that's why a lot of people, you know, kind of focus on that and they kind of, that's kind of where it ends for them. But the magic really happens in layer two. The magic really happens when you start focusing on these chord changes. And I know it can seem like a lot. I know it can seem, you know, like how am I ever going to keep up with these chord changes? But if you kind of look at it as numbers instead of actual chords, and then you use these shapes that are formed on the fretboard to kind of help you out, you're going to be like, oh, that's just a one, five, six, four chord progression. I know how to solo over that. I've done that a million times. Oh, we're in the key of E major now? Not a problem. I know how to solo over a one, five, six, four chord progression in any key. I'm just going to play it in the key of E major now. I already know where these shapes are within my soloing framework. Oh, you're using a major three chord now instead of the in key minor three chord? No problem. I know what to do over a major three chord. I've been there. I've done that. I know exactly where the, the outside note happens to fall 
when a major three chord is introduced into the chord progression that I'm soloing over. Oh, you guys played in the key of C minor? I usually played in the key of A minor. No problem. Let me just move the shapes up to here. Gotcha, no problem. So hopefully I'm making sense here. Anyway, that's what I have to say about uh, the uh, shape theory with regards to layer two. I hope this video is helpful for you guys. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Mm -hmm.